I feel like it's really important to give you a little context before I dive in. Um, why they would actually let somebody with hair like this speak at the World Economic Forum is beyond me, but thank you. I'll try not to waste anybody's time. First of all, I just want to point out that I was a very cool child. Uh, I'm not sure if you guys are up on global fashion trends. Sideways trucker hats are very in right now, and I started the movement, so that's proof. More to the point, though, that photograph of me was taken in a, uh, in a campground, and that says something about my parents. My parents believed that getting my brother and I outside and instilling with us a curiosity about the natural world was pivotal to our development. So they began that process very early. And that curiosity uh, was very, very helpful and has been helpful for me throughout my life. That said, in my adolescence, I felt very much like a social misfit. I felt as though I didn't fit in anywhere. And, you know, nature and being outside gave me some form of identity, but it wasn't enough. Uh, that curiosity led me to some social realms that ultimately uh, found me dropped out of high school at 14 years old. I went to high school two years early and all of a sudden I was, for the most part, homeless. I was taken in off the streets by friends, but there were years uh, of tumult that led to a, a deep searching and a deep feeling of being disconnected. I don't think it's any coincidence that it was ultimately climbing and exploration and adventure that brought me out of that time period. It was a very trying time period for me. Searching for identity is one of the most damaging things we do as humans. When we don't know who we are, how can we continue? But it did give me some incredible insights and it taught me some incredible lessons. Uh, being on the street gives you huge, huge insights as to how we struggle and how we overcome, what we're capable of. Uh, seeing people on the street allows you to understand what we really are as an animal. Uh, you know, the person on the right here, I didn't go to high school, right and left are tough. Um, the person on the right, you know, they're living as a forager, as a hunter-gatherer, and we tend to pass judgment. But my time there allowed me to see something different, that we are capable of things that we don't even believe ourselves to be capable of. And that idea carried over into my work. It carried over into everything that I do. And I look back now with sort of this 2020 hindsight, and I see that that time period not only gave me a framework through which I can tell stories, but it gave me a whole ideology of how capable we are, not only as individuals, but as a human family to overcome serious issues. Climbing in and of itself as the thing that brought me back to some manner of stasis is a beautiful and very graphic storytelling tool. It invokes inspiration, it, it ignites this idea of how powerful we are. What we can do as humans is truly, truly fantastic. Uh, but as I, as I started to climb more and more and more, and as I started to have more success in this arena, and as I started to become what would be called a professional climber, and as I started to make money from this, I was able to travel more. And as I traveled more, I started to become somewhat disenchanted with what I was doing. Not that I didn't love climbing, I love climbing very much, but it seemed like there were bigger stories around me that needed to be told. The climbing started to feel myopic, it started to feel selfish. How could I, coming from a privileged background, then go out, use this privilege to simply climb a mountain, celebrate myself, and not celebrate everything that was around me? These stories became incredible. These stories became the ones that I wanted to tell. These were the human stories, not the triumph stories, not the chest-pounding ego stories. This is where I wanted to invest my time. That said, I never gave it up. Uh, climbing was always something that I needed to do. It, it will always be something that I need to do. It was in me from a very young age. And in the winter of 2010, 2011, I was asked to go to Pakistan in winter to climb Gashabram II, which is an 8,000 meter peak on the border of India. This trip fundamentally changed my life. It was sort of when the door to National Geographic cracked open. We summited, I became the first American to summit any 8,000 meter peak in winter, and we were hit by a massive avalanche on the way down, and we all nearly died, three of us. And right after that avalanche, uh, I took this picture, which is arguably my most well-known image. You know, thanks in no small part to this. Thank you. <laughs> Um, 
What's so funny about that is that's a selfie, right? So uh, it's just proof to all the millennials that you too can take a selfie and get it on the cover of National Geographic. So keep trying. That's what everybody wants to hear, right? But more important than this, more important than this moment, was another gift that I was given. The real reason that National Geographic opened its doors was because right next to our base camp, there was a Pakistani military encampment. And we had internet, and these guys are young Pakistani soldiers. They wanted to watch movies. They started to come over. We started to have tea. They asked if they could use my Facebook. I said yes. I have hundreds of friends named Mohammed, Farooq, and Ahmed now, and I'm on the TSA watch list. I don't know why, <laughs> but it's okay. It's a thing that happens. And um, anyway, the, the real beauty of that is the access I was given into their lives, right? They invited me in. And it's these pictures, it was this essay that actually opened the doors with my current photo editor at National Geographic, Sadie Courier. These pictures, pictures that have impact, pictures that tell bigger, broader stories, stories that need attention. I love this image so much. It's so painful for me, but it reminds me of a quote by Bertrand Russell that says, war does not determine who is right, only who is left. And I love that. I love that play on words because these images started to become my driving force. This is what I wanted to do. My first magazine article was to the border of Nepal and Tibet to an area called Mustang. We were exploring cave complexes using climbing to access them. So you can see that little guy in red. This was a particularly dangerous cave complex to access. Right below there, we had one serious head injury, 21 centimeter skull fracture and collapse, and I broke my back trying to get into this cave system. This was before Susan was editor, just so you guys know. So, um, but we were getting into these cave systems to peel back the layers. This is what we do. We look back. We get into the darkness. We get into the dust. We look into the mystery. What we were really looking for was human remains, burial crypts, because in burial crypts you find teeth and teeth have strontium, and God, or whatever, the infinite wisdom of the universe, actually had a, a geotag long before Google, and it's strontium. You find it in your tooth enamel, and it shows where you were born on the planet, and it's based on what your mother is eating and drinking, and that goes right there. So if you find somebody's tooth in one part of the world, but they were born in a different part of the world, and you find somebody else's tooth over in the same place, and they were born over here, you start to have this beautiful picture of human migration and trade. And why is that important? Why do we need to look into our past? Well, if we look into our past, we start to understand where we make mistakes consistently, where we thrive, and where we continually uh, sort of screw up and what makes us collapse. We are an exploitative species, and as soon as we exploit our resources too much, things tend to fall apart. So this was really, really important to me because this was the culmination of science adventure. This was where I brought everything that I had been doing my entire life together. And looking back became something that I saw as very important to looking forward, to understanding where we were going. Because humans make mistakes. We are a very, very impactful species. And we don't seem to learn very well. And our, our mistakes are not just ours, they, they impact everything around us. One of my next assignments was to a place called Franz Josef Land, uh, which is an archipelago in the Russian Arctic. It's actually, you know, this is not representative of what the entire archipelago looks like. In fact, this is a very small fraction. The reason it's so important for us to study and understand a place like Franz Josef Land is because it is nearly an intact ecosystem, almost 99% intact. So when we look at a 99% intact ecosystem, that gives us a beautiful baseline from which to actually study the effects of human-caused climate change. We need that pure baseline, and Franz Josef Land gave us that. It shows us really the kinds of effects we're having, where 100 years ago this would be 100% ice. That polar bear wouldn't be standing there. He posed for me, I paid him a lot of money, but don't, let's just, let's keep that in this room. But honestly, this photograph is, is one of the most impactful I've ever made. It's one of the most heart-wrenching. And I think it was David Quammen who said, yeah, he kind of looks like he's looking south towards the future. And I think that's exactly right. It's reasonable to think 
that if our home is disintegrating around us, fairly soon we will be homeless. And it's those issues that we have to start paying attention to. It's not just on the poles that I work. Uh, I have been blessed to continue to evolve as a photographer, not simply as an adventurer, but somebody who can document social change as well. Usually there's an adventure tie. One of my next assignments was to the Angolan Highlands. At least that's where it started. Now, Angola, as I'm sure many of you know, was you know, embroiled in a 30-year civil war, very bloody, uh, between the MPLA and UNITA. And this ecosystem was really protected by that war. Much of the wildlife in this area was driven out uh, because of the fighting, or was poached. Our charge was to actually descend 1,200 miles of an unexplored river catchment, a place that the only people that had been there since the MPLA and UNITA were the Portuguese. So no Europeans had been in there, really, and it, there was certainly no scientific data around it. And we wanted to do a scientific and social megatransect of the Quito River catchment, which is one of the largest, in fact, I think the largest unexplored river catchment on the planet. It started as a six-week trip that ended up being four months. I mean, honestly, it was one of the hardest things I've ever done. This makes it look like a lazy day on the river. Well, you can imagine if you're supposed to cover 25 kilometers of river, like straight line in a day, and the river's always doing these oxbows, it gets a little annoying. You've traveled like 10 feet after 20 minutes. And you're like, come on. But not only that, you know, at first we were dragging the Makoros through waist high grass. And then once we finally had enough water to get on, we were chopping through these forests, getting in the water with crocodiles, getting in the water with snakes. It wasn't tremendously fun. And at times I wonder if the magazine just says, who would do this? And they're like, oh, just give it to Corey, see what happens, you know, like. <laughs> but anyway. It's really important to note that the conflict kept this area safe, but as soon as we start taking landmines out of the ground, people move in and they start exploiting it. It's really important to understand who is using this water, where they're using this water, and how they're using this water, because it is all interconnected. And the resources that are potentially there are going to impact all these people that use the water if they start to be exploited. So we wanted to look at everything from artisanal fishing to industrial use, how it's all tied together. It gives us a clearer presentation to the Angolan government to say, okay, this is how you know, resource uh, extraction might actually impact this entire ecosystem. It's really important to figure out who's going to be impacted most. Because as governments, we think big picture, and we say, well, here's one thing that we can use over here for this other thing over here, and we forget what's in between. And honestly, this is what's in between. So all these people will be forced out of this area. These people had not seen any Europeans ever. So it was strange when, you know, 12 white dudes in Makoros were coming downstream. You know, they were pretty intrigued. Why is this water so important? Why is a, a, a river catchment in, in the Angolan Highlands so important? Well, the reason is, in southern Africa, there's a big floodplain, and some of you may have heard of it. It's called the Okavango Delta. The Okavango Delta is the jewel of southern Africa. It's the jewel of Africa. It is flooded every year by 11 cubic kilometers of water. It's a beating heart. As it floods, the animal migrations come in. As it dries up, they go out. This is life in southern Africa. And almost every single ounce of water that comes into the delta is fed from the Angolan highlands. And as Angola starts to look for ways to make money as they feel this crunch from the oil crisis going on over there, they're looking at all of their possible, possible places they can find this money to drum up, right? And so this isn't a story about a river catchment. It's a story about three countries coming together to find a commonality. It's about a river that ties three countries together. And it's a story that's allegorical to us all, right? We are not independent of one another. This is an ecosystem that crosses, it doesn't care about boundaries, Angola, Namibia, Botswana. And if somebody upstream decides to dam it or use it in a different way, not only does that affect the ecosystem, but it upsets the entire economy of both countries downstream. 
So we have to start to think inclusively instead of exclusively. What is our self-preservation versus our self-interest? Because there's a lot at stake there, a tremendous amount at stake in the Delta. The Delta itself is a UNESCO World Heritage Site, but upstream is unprotected. So I'm always reminded of a quote that's by Norma McLean. It says, eventually all things merge into one and a river runs through it. And that couldn't be more true in this case. That is a literal interpretation of this story. However, there is something larger to be learned from that. What is the river that runs through us all that helps us make better decisions, better collective decisions as a human family? That's a big question. And we don't know the answer, not yet, but we're working on it. And we're working on it right now. My next assignment, the one I'm continuing to work on, is uh, the hardest thing I've ever done. A boy said to a man, I want happiness. The man said, remove I, that is your ego, remove want, that is your desire, and what remains is your happiness. This guy knows what I'm talking about. Everybody wants what this guy's got, right? Happiness. Happiness is important to us. We tend to think it's this fluffy thing that we can just talk about, oh, I want to be happy, I want to be happy. Well, sure, I just Googled happiness memes yesterday, and this was the first one that came up. It's good, right? Like, that's pretty good. But there's millions of them, right? Like, everybody has a different idea of what happiness is. So we're trying to actually qualify and quantify it. We're working with Gallup and the OECD to figure out where are the happiest places in the world and why. And there's some very simple things. And these are things that we can communicate not only to our local governments, but, you know, nationally as well. Community. We need community. In Denmark... There are socially funded clubs. You can just apply and say, hey, we want to have, for example, a singles club. This is singles. They come down every Thursday night, play music and sing and drink, right? So community is a huge one. And the government gives them money for that. There are ra rabbit jumping clubs in Denmark. It's amazing. <laughs> That's a thing. They just run around and you know, jump rabbits. But community, friends, family, people who share your values. You know, that is very important. How can we encourage governments to promote that? A connection with nature, which is where this all started. Teaching our kids from a very young age that food comes from the ground, not from the grocery store. This is a program that brings kids out of the classroom, teaches them to plant, and brings them all the way through harvest, and then puts the ground back to bed for the next class the next year. This is important. This is one of the most important things we can do for our kids because it gives them respect for the earth, and their health, right? It gives them ownership. Why would they want to damage something that's feeding them? Tolerance. We need tolerance. And not, not, it's not just, you know, freedom of expression. It's tolerance. It's sexuality, gender, whatever it happens to be, we need to promote global tolerance. Because hatred begets hatred. Uh, purpose. This guy here is doing work as a volunteer in a hospital. These guys, their security, but work that gives us purpose, service that provides us with an identity that helps us understand how we are serving other people. Honoring our traditions, where we come from, not destroying our cultural heritage. Honoring faith. These things are important to our happiness. Our happiness is defined by knowing our identities. And that's much, much simpler than we think, and it's much more complex. But one of the things that we can look at is where people are happy and why. And then we can study those social structures and say to, to everybody who can provide social policy infrastructure, this is what makes people happy. Play. We all need to play. This is important in life. This is something we have to do. Happiness ties the world together. Happiness allows us to make better decisions together. It allows us to think inclusively instead of exclusively. This is not unique to any one specific place, but I can tell you climbing mountains doesn't necessarily expose it. I've gone and looked for happiness everywhere. This is right below the summit of Everest. I didn't find it. I thought I would. I didn't find it. I've looked under the ocean. I didn't find it. The only place we can look is within ourselves, and we can look to our history to understand where we're going. We can look to where we've made mistakes. And we can start to understand that we have to be inclusive 
That's the big message here. And when we can start to implement social policy that gives us the platform to act happily with one another, we make better decisions as a human family. Thank you guys so much for having me.